Okay, good afternoon and welcome back to the Action Collaborative's virtual symposium. Our next session will focus on person-centered evidence-based pain management. Effective pain management is critical to curbing the opioid epidemic and preventing future prescription drug crises. It is also essential to ensuring quality person-centered care. I'm delighted to introduce this panel of experts who will discuss promising practices and critical opportunities to strengthen person-centered pain management. The session will be moderated by Dr. Helen Burston, who is Vice President and Chief Executive Officer of the Council of Medical Specialty Societies. And joining Dr. Burston are Dr. Roger Chow, who is a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Medical Informatics and Clinical Epidemiology at Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Robert Rich, <clears throat> who is Medical Director at Bladen Medical Associates and Adjunct Professor, Associate Professor in the School of Osteopathic Medicine at Campbell University. Dr. Christina Mickis, who is a medical officer in the Division of Overdose Prevention at the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. Dr. Daniel Nett, who is Vice President of Health Strategy and Innovation at CVS Health. And Ms. Penny Cohen, who is founder and CEO of the American Chronic Pain Association. Their full biographies are available on the event website for you to access. And please note that we will be taking questions from the webinar audience during the last 10 minutes of the session. Please use the Q&A box on your screen to enter a question. And now I'll turn things over to Dr. Burson. Great, thank you so much, Liz. And we're really excited to have this important session today on person-centered evidence-based pain management. Uh, for those of you who've been following the work of the collaborative, you may note that we actually had a, our initial work group was focused only on opioid guidelines and evidence. And we in, fairly quickly with our wonderful work group decided we needed a, a more expanded lens to make sure we really got at person-centered evidence-based pain management as part of the overall uh, countering the opioid epidemic uh, crisis. So as you'll hear during the session today, we'll have some uh, presentations that really touch on issues of both acute and chronic pain, the use of opioids, the use of non-opioids, the importance of shared decision-making, the importance of really thinking about both short and long-term impacts, um, as well as really understanding the impact on patients and the importance of uh, partnership with patients as we go through many of these issues like tapering, uh, prescribing, and uh, ongoing management. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn to our first presenter, Roger Chow, who will give us an overview of uh, the acute pain management work and uh, guidelines that are uh, beginning to emerge out of NAM um, and elsewhere. Roger, I'll turn it to you. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> it's great to be here, and um, thank you to everyone for joining this session. Um, I know things are very um, uh, challenging right now. Um, so um, I am uh, going to be talking about acute pain, um, specifically about guidelines and evidence standards and how they um, tie into this, con to this uh, theme of uh, patient-centered care. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, um, so just a, a little bit of background. Um, uh, you know, historically, a lot of the guideline efforts have really focused more on chronic pain. Uh, it's been assumed that acute pain is effective, and we know that acute pain is often treated and relieved um, uh, by opioids. Um, however, there is emerging evidence that uh, a number of acute pain conditions actually respond um, uh, similarly to non-opioid um, and non-pharmacologic approaches. Um, we do know that opioids can provide effective relief for severe acute pain or when patients don't respond to other treatments. Uh, so this is definitely not to say that opioids don't have a role, um, but we're also uh, learning that using how we use opioids for acute pain can impact long-term use um, and associated complications with that. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that practices in the U.S., um, uh, differ from many parts of the world. Um, uh, in 2017, 17% of the U.S. population received at least one opioid prescription. Uh, this is much higher than most countries. And the way we prescribe opioids for acute conditions is actually quite different as well. Um, U.S. dentists prescribe opioids 37 times more frequently than dentists in the U.K., uh, for patients undergoing minor surgery in the United States, they receive opioids seven times more frequently than Swedish patients. Uh, so I think this at least calls into a question, um, you know, what, what accounts for these differences and are they really um, uh, helping uh, to improve pain? Um, as I mentioned, being a prescribed opioids for acute pain is associated with long-term use. We have multiple studies now showing that. 
Uh, and opioids, as everyone knows, are associated with unique risks, not just to the patient, uh, but in terms of diversion and misuse and societal issues. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm, a lot of the material I have will be is, comes from a recent uh, report that comes from the National Academies on framing opioid prescribing guidelines for acute pain. It's really trying to develop the evidence to uh, to to develop uh, patient-centered guidelines. Um, I was a member of this uh, committee. Uh, next slide. Um, so this was an ad hoc committee. Um, convened by uh, the National Academies. Uh, the, the task of the committee was to identify existing guidelines on opioids for acute pain, identify high priority conditions um, for guidelines, uh, develop a framework for evaluating the evidence in guidelines, um, evaluate existing guidelines using that framework, and then develop a prioritized research agenda uh, to enable us to um, have uh, more evidence-based guidelines in the future. Uh, next slide. Just a little back background on guidelines for acute pain. Um, the, goals, the goals of the guideline are to promote effective management of pain. At the same time, we want to avoid harms, including those associated with opioids. Uh, so these are both important facets. Uh, we don't want to reduce opioids and then have people have uncontrolled pain. At the same time, we don't want to you know, pres over-prescribe opioids and have, have people have unnecessary complications. Um, there are a number of guidelines out there. Um, there are also what, what I call, what, what we refer to as policies. So these are not um, guidelines in the classic sense coming from a professional society, but from a state or local jurisdiction about um, how opioids should be prescribed uh, for acute pain. Many of the guidelines address uh, opioid prescription duration and dose. Uh, some of them require accessing PDMP data, et cetera. Uh, I'm sorry for the typo there. Um, the, the, one of the issues, however, is that the evidence base for the guidelines is currently limited. Um, almost all of the guidelines focus on effects on opioid prescribing, so how much opioid is prescribed. Uh, what is lacking um, is evidence on effects on patient outcomes, um, both beneficial, so how well is pain controlled, how quickly can people get back to work, et cetera, as well as harmful. Uh, do people have uh, side effects? What's the, how, do they end up on long-term opioids and do they end up having problems for them? Um, and there's other outcomes like the need for refills, um, trying to get refills on the weekend, for example, which can be very difficult at times. Um, I think that you, we you have to acknowledge that it's difficult to evaluate long-term outcomes uh, when we're looking at uh, treatments for uh, uh, acute pain as well as misuse and diversion. So this has been a challenge in the field. Uh, next slide. Um, there are a number of key principles that the committee um, uh, worked off of. Um, one is that guidelines should be based on evidence that evaluate the efficacy and effectiveness of interventions on health outcomes. Uh, guidelines should use the highest quality evidence available. And the last is really important, that even though guidelines are developed uh, to apply to populations of patients, uh, they need to allow for individualization of care to the extent possible. Every patient is different and their needs and context um, can influence the way that we manage them. Uh, next slide. Um, this slide um, just shows um, the, L the uh, guideline development process. Um, it, 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 it is a pretty extensive uh, process that we go through to develop clinical practice guidelines. Uh, we start by have, uh, establishing the group, determining the scope of what the guideline will focus on. Um, we apply an analytical framework, which we're, I'm going to talk about in a second. We do our literature search and evaluate the evidence, and then we develop our recommendations. This last piece, that orange arrow, is critical that, it's, that you're not done when you put out a guideline. It's important to see how the guideline works, what the impacts of it are on uh, patients as well. And so there's this uh, feedback loop that should take place. Um, it's, and sometimes that, 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 that it, that's done uh, to more or lesser degrees. Uh, next slide. Um, 
the analytic framework is critical. I, I would say this is one of the centerpieces of the NASM document. Um, it, the, 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 the idea is to uh, be able to show the evidence links that we need to get from the left side of the framework, which is a patient presenting with acute pain, to the right side of the framework, which is uh, the health outcomes, pain, function, quality of life, um, other uh, side effects. Um, to get from the left side to the right side, we have to look at various links. Um, so we can look at how opioid prescribing strategies directly impact um, those types of outcomes. Um, but as I mentioned before, oftentimes we don't have that direct evidence and we have what we call intermediate outcomes. So we can see how much opioids are prescribed, how much are used and unused, how many refill requests there are. But those don't directly tell us uh, what patients are experiencing. And we need to also look at these other links to, to, to understand um, uh, what does it actually mean if somebody doesn't use their opioids? What does it mean if somebody, you know, has to have a refill request? How does that impact their quality of life, et cetera? Um, and so the, the analytic framework is really important for being able to show these different links and also to understand where we have gaps. And so, as I mentioned before, we have uh, quite a bit of evidence now or accumulating evidence on the effects of different opioid prescribing strategies on intermediate outcomes, but we're still lacking um, evidence on those uh, patient and population health outcomes on the right. The analytic framework enables us to be very explicit about um, the types of evidence we're looking for and to show where the gaps exist, as well as where the evidence um, is present. Uh, next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, one of the goals of the panel was to identify priority conditions for acute pain guidelines. These were based on um, how frequent or common the, con the, uh, the, uh, the conditions were or the procedures being done were, um, whether there was a gap in terms of practice, um, whether there's uncertainty or other issues um, in terms of prescribing. Uh, so as you can see, there's a number of surgical procedures that were identified. Uh, as well as a number of medical procedures, including dental pain, uh, low back pain is very common, of course, things like sickle cell disease and musculoskeletal conditions. Uh, next slide. Um, and then it's then uh, and the the panel also identified a number of research priorities. Uh, and as I mentioned before, it's critical that we understand the effects of prescribing strategies on health outcomes, not just how much opioids are prescribed. We can't assume that, you know, that uh, tells us the whole picture about what's happening with patients. Um, we also want to understand the effects of prescribing strategies on population level outcomes as well as individual level outcomes. Uh, in other words, things like how much, uh, how many overdoses are occurring in a community um, when these types of strategies are implemented. So it's not just looking at uh, the patient that's being prescribed the opioids, but uh, other people who are impacted. Um, we need to understand opioids and prescribing in the context of non-opioid interventions. So it's important that, that research and guidelines uh, think about the context of other things that are being used. Um, there's key patient populations um, um, uh, that, that we also need to uh, identify research for. Uh, think about the clinical setting in which opioids are prescribed, for example, in ED versus primary care setting, and as mentioned before, really understanding the link between intermediate and health outcomes. Um, I believe that's the last of my slides, so I'll hand it back to Helen. Great. Thanks, Roger. You raised so many important and interesting issues. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, Chuck Rich, who will give us an overview of the work he's been doing with our work group on opioid tapering. I'll mention that as we started to prioritize the work of our work group with my co-chair Deb Horry, it was striking how, how unanimous uh, the focus on this topic was as an area where we needed both better evidence as well as uh, better guidance on how to work with patients and clinicians. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, thanks Chuck. Thank you, Helen, appreciate that. And again, Roger, good topic and everything. You, you set me up well. Just as a background for everyone today, please understand that I am a primary care physician representing the American Academy Family Physician on our work group. And as a result, I'm still actively involved in the clinical practice in a rural underserved area with a great deal of patients which have been impacted by social determinants of health, which has led for many reasons to the issues of chronic non-cancerous pain and the use of long-term opioid treatments in that pain. Next slide. 
As a background, I mentioned that, but one of the areas that is not covered very well or is in the process of being better developed in many of the guidelines that, were, that are in use at the same time is the subject of the legacy patient, a term that we've used in the treatment of those patients that are already on long-term opioid therapy for chronic pain. These are individuals that may have been on opioids 5, 10, 20, I've seen even 30 years of continuous usage of opioids, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, that is what you may be, uh, again, faced with as a physician um, that this patient present to you. Unfortunately, those, some of those pain patients, in addition to possibly being on high-dose opioid therapy, they often are on it in combinations with benzodiazepines and hypnotics. So you've got quite a combination of medications that you may be faced with, again, particularly in the primary care setting in terms of what to do which when you're confronted with those patients, you, you, you ask yourself the question, what do I do? Do I punt and say that's not a patient that I can handle, which is, we're observing a lot in a lot of primary care settings this day and time. Do I just continue with the status quo or do I investigate what really should be done to help best manage these patients? Hence the subject of opioid tapering. Next slide. As you, as you may be aware, and this is intuitive, again, we are, we are saying that there are some benefits to be obtained from opioid tapering. Certainly, again, there's more need for more studies, but we already know from several studies, including one released just this past year, that in a lot of patients who are successfully tapered, there is an improvement in pain and function in those patients just upon functional scores, et cetera. As you as it intuitive, Certainly, again, with opioid tapering, there is a, a lessened risk of accidental overdose and death, as well as an improvement in side effect profiles, such as constipation from long-term opioid use, as well as the effect on other organ systems. And clearly, again, certain, there are certain high-risk populations which you certainly would like to reduce the ongoing usage of opioids for whatever reason, such as your pregnant population. Next slide. Conversely, we, we, we wonder, again, are there risks of opioid tapers? There are some anecdotal stories of, of patients which have had adverse effects of tapers, but this clearly is an area where we need better research, and we'll touch on that at the end of the discussion. But clearly, we are concerned that opioid taping may be associated with worsened pain, certainly in the, in the acute term, but hopefully not in the long term. You may unmask through the process of tapering undiagnosed opioid dependency and substance abuse. You may also unmask, and from experience, undiagnosed behavioral health issues which have been quiescent in the patient's profile for some time and have never been addressed. And certainly, again, rapid opioid tapering or rapid discontinuation of opioids in the patient that's already on long-term opioid therapy certainly can lead to the precipitation of withdrawal syndrome and the consequences of what would happen of that. And I won't necessarily address that in today's discussion, but certainly that can occur in someone who's rapidly tapered or suddenly discontinued from the long-term therapy. Next slide. We think about it, two scenarios in terms of the patient that may present to you that you would like to consider or may be a, subject, a candidate for open tapering. Ideally, you're talking about an individual that would come to you requesting that they be tapered off of their opioid therapy or have the opioid therapy tapered down. I really acknowledge that this is an unusual to rare occurrence. I have been gratified through my career to have actually have had several patients, including one on very high dose opioid therapy that came to me with a request that they be tapered down. This was a patient coming from another provider. Uh, certainly, again, if you get those individuals, you like to strike while the iron is hot, as they say, and try to find out what is motivating that individual and then work with them to, to facilitate that tapering, again, a successful manner. More commonly, as you can imagine, it's more likely the provider-initiated taper that you'll be faced with, again, in dealing with these patients. Um, this is where you determine after an assessment of the risks versus benefits of, of their therapy shouldn't they be considered for a taper. You also want to think about, again, what may be a factor which in your mind is leading to a need for taper, such as 
medication, ad adverse events on long-term therapy, accidental overdose, and other factors. And in that situation, which represents, with this patient population, the provider initiation tapering representing the most common form of, of opening tapering. Again, the reason that you would want to consider those tapering those patients. Next slide. As Helen mentioned, I guess, at the start of our, of our presentation, one of the strategies that's successful in pain management and, and certainly for opioid tapering is patient buy-in and shared decision-making. I've already mentioned that in this situation with tapering, you're trying to approach from the standpoint of understanding what, be a, what may be a motivating factor for patient tapering and what you can act upon from the patient presentation which may be, give you a, a step up to actually motivate the patient to participate in tapering. Certainly some of those discussions in the tapering process, you're going to, you're, you're going to be discussing the risk versus benefits, possible protocols that you may be looking at for in terms of how you're going to consider a taper with a patient. And again, again, discussions, concerns that the patient may have, including again, what may happen to the pain and what's their risk of withdrawal. These are certainly discussions that I like to entertain. And the very first discussion of the patient that, that's sometimes presenting as a new patient. But we certainly recommend that that discussion be maintained throughout the entire tapering process in terms of maintaining the patient's motivation and maintaining the patient's buy-in. Next slide. A couple of slides we were talking about briefly as some adjuncts to tapering. One of which is the subject of interdisciplinary teams. This has primarily been looked at mostly in the inpatient setting, but in the outpatient setting, I think clearly, again, there is certainly a need for further research in terms of how it can be done. In my own practice, I've certainly made use of care managers working with the patients on an outpatient basis, behavioral health staff, for all the way from psychiatrists, all the way down to behavioral health social workers, to pharmacists in terms of certainly helping to spread the information about the risk versus benefits of, of long-term opioid therapy and how best to work with the medications that, are, that they're taking. Another tool which I have used in my practice some and which again has been talked about in one of the research articles listed here is tapering agreements. Similar to the, the clinical uh, contract which you may put in place when the patient is presenting to you for their pain management care, Similarly, a tapering agreement can be constructed and that acts as an instrument that you and the patient can refer back to during the process to help remind you and the patient in terms of what you agreed upon in terms of how to taper the long-term therapy again and other elements which can be included in that in such things as the speed of taper, what your endpoints are, what provisions you may have to evoke in terms of dealing with uh, deviances from your tapering process, including the need for consultation. Next slide. I've mentioned briefly speed of tapering, and I will say, again, this is an area where we need a lot more research in terms of the best recommended speed of tapering that, that should be undertaken with a patient. Suffice it to say, one size does not fit all. And you will learn at it, through the process of tapering that in many times the speed of a taper may be much slower than you ever anticipated, often taking months to years. The various guidelines have, have given the various suggestions in terms of what be a recommended tapering speed. But I, again, I, I encourage you to be patient and exercise, again, an understanding that this process may often be much slower than you would ever like. Uh, one thing also to realize that sometimes the end point of tapering may not be the complete discontinuation of all long-term opioid therapy for patients, but may result in just a reduction in their doses to the lowest effective doses, particularly if it's, it's in combination with other medications. Again, we do have some tools which we have recommended to help guide that process. These are functional assessment tools and objective tools, which when used in the process on an ongoing basis, allows you to, to compare scores from visit to visit in terms of how a patient may be doing during the tapering process 
and are they doing well or are they not doing well and is this possibly a reason to possibly pause the process. Next slide. As I alluded to, behavioral health issues certainly are an underlying thing in many patients that are on chronic long-term opioid therapy for chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, additional research really needs to be done in terms of fully, to truly establish the, the incidence of behavioral health conditions, but certainly suffice it to say that in many of the patients, both anecdotally and from research, there is clearly a substantial proportion of those patients with behavioral health issues. Some of those dis concerns, including certainly depression, personality disorders, and as you can imagine, substance abuse disorders. During the process of caring for patients, we do recommend the use of various uh, behavioral health assessment tools to guide that process. There, I won't go into the discussion of those tools, but they are out there. And it certainly, again, is beneficial to use those tools, both at the initiation of a tapering process and throughout that process. One general comment that I would make in reference to this process of tapering, if substance abuse disorder is detected and suspected, in many respects, the tapering process ultimately shifts from one of tapering to one that really becomes more management and treatment of the substance abuse disorder. Next slide. Some additional adjuncts that I, that I do suggest to be considered in the tapering process. Non-pharmacologic therapies do have a benefit to these patients in terms of helping to reduce some of the factors which may be leading to the patient's chronic pain. And therefore, again, by reducing those factors, you're able to therefore, again, hopefully lessen their dependence upon the use of opioid therapy for management of that pain. Certainly from a non-pharmacologic standpoint, there's some good evidence looking at cognitive behavioral therapy, but in, also in practice, such things as chiropractic therapy, physical therapy, and even patient exercise amongst others may be uh, some non-pharmacologic uh, therapies which help the process. Uh, many of us are aware of the various pharmacologic adjuncts that, uh, again, are, are available to help manage pain. Besides, of course, I won't go into discussion of that, but suffice it to say, one of the goals of use of these therapies is again to lessen the dependence upon lessen the usage of the opioid therapy as the mainstay of managing the patient's chronic pain. Um, in practice, many of the patients that I've seen through the years have come to me often have been lacking in those adjunctive therapies. And certainly one of the first things that I've done through my practice is make use of getting those adjunctive therapies on board to help lessen, again, the, the dependence upon opioids. Next slide. To sum up my session, uh, again, a couple of points. Number one, patients on pre-existing long-term opioid therapy for non-cancerous pain should be considered for tapering. Number two, successful tapering, as I've alluded to, may not result in complete cessation of opioids, but hopefully tapering to the lowest effective doses based upon assessments of pain and function. Three, as I've alluded to, tapering is often going to take months and often years. Number four, strongly recommend the use of adjunctive strategies and therapies to aid in the tapering process and hopefully, again, lessen the patient depending upon opioid pain relievers. Number five, as also, patient buy-in, patient education is critically important both at the initiation of any tapering process and throughout the tapering process. And again, it's best achieved via, via a shared decision-making process. And finally, uh, again, as I've already alluded to, there's a lot of areas that are still, we have a lot of gaps that are still regarding the process of opioid taping, the subject of opioid taping, and you'll see hopefully further research to help answer some of those questions to come. Helen? Wonderful. Thanks so much, Chuck. Uh, Chuck that, that was a really rich discussion. And as, you, as I've been watching the chat box, raise some important questions that we'll come back to during discussion. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to uh, Christina Mickus from CDC to give us an overview of their work um, related to uh, guidelines for chronic pain. Christina? Great. Thank you, Helen, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, this is Christina Mickus of the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control of the CDC. I'm going to spend my time talking a little bit about the 2016 CDC guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. Uh, 
I'll start by walking through some of those recommendation statements. I'll then talk a little bit about misapplication of the CDC guideline, and I'll close up my presentation by talking a little bit about the guideline update process. Next slide, please. The CDC guideline for prescribing opioids was uh, released in March of 2016. It was published in the Morbidity and Mortality World, uh, Report by the CDC and also was published in JAMA. Next, uh, next slide, please. And it was, uh, it was providing recommendations for the prescribing of opioid pain medications for adult populations. So it was focused on patients age 18 and older specifically in outpatient primary care settings and was focused again on treatment of chronic pain. Uh, it was not intended for use in active cancer treatment, palliative care, and midwife care. And as mentioned before, the primary audience for the CDC guideline was primary care providers, so specifically those working in family practice or internal medicine, and uh, was targeted towards physicians, but also nurse practitioners and physician assistants that may be working in those practice environments. Next slide, please. I'd like to start by highlighting some of the recommendation statements in the guideline that were most relevant to initiating opioid therapy. So first and foremost, uh, opioids were not considered first-line treatments or routine therapy for chronic pain. Maximizing non-opioid treatments for, for chronic pain uh, was the recommendation. And we should establish and measure progress towards goals uh, for pain management, discuss benefits and risks with patients with asserting opioids, use immediate release opioids when starting opioids rather than um, uh, extended release formulations. And for management of acute pain, three days or less of opioid therapy was considered to often be sufficient, um, with more than seven days uh, really needed. Next slide, please. This slide focuses on recommendations relevant to starting or continuing opioids. So as mentioned before, maximizing the use of non-opioid treatments. That would include medications that are not opioids, as, all, as well as non-pharmacologic ways of treating pain, things like exercise. Um, using caution when increasing dosages, so reassessing the benefits and risks of increasing dosage to greater than or equal to 50 morphine milligram equivalents per day and avoiding or justifying increasing dosages to greater than or equal to 90 morphine milligram equivalents per day. Uh, per day. Um, depending on the individual uh, risk benefit calculation for, for patients and uh, their context for pain management. Also checking uh, the PDMP for other prescriptions, um, including high total dosages, avoiding concurrent prescribing of benzodiazepines and opioids, prescribing the loxone for those patients deemed at higher risk of overdose, and then offering or arranging for our medication-assisted treatment, or MAT, for patients with opioid use disorder. Next slide, please. There was specific guidance in the 2016 guideline for patients who already were receiving long-term opioid therapies. So most of the guideline was focused on initiating opioid therapy, but there were some some sections that were pertinent to those patients who were already on long-term opioid therapy. So for these patients, it was recommended to regularly review the benefits and risks of continuing opioids um, and providing interested and motivated patients with support to slowly taper opioid dosages. So this goes back to the presentation that Dr. Rich just gave. Uh, establishing goals with patients who do continue on opioid therapy and then again, maximizing pain treatment modalities with non-pharmacologic and non-opioid pharma, uh, pharmacologic treatments. Next slide, please. Also, uh, empathetically reviewing risks associated with continuing high-dose opioids, offering a slow taper if benefits aren't felt to outweigh risks. So again, this is something that's uh, determined on an individualized basis for individual patients. And for those patients who do agree to taper opioids to lower dosages, working very closely with the patient on a tapering plan. And also lastly, closely monitoring and mitigating overdose risk for those patients who do continue to take high dose opioids. Next slide, please. I, I will only touch on this just because Dr. Rich covered this so thoroughly in his presentation, but um, within the 2016 guidelines, there was some tapering guidance also offered. 
So again, optimizing non-opioid pain management is a central theme. I think I've highlighted it in every slide. Uh, tapering slowly enough to minimize opioid withdrawal. Um, and again, patients take, uh, tapering opioids after taking them for quite some time might need very slow opioid tapers. So again, Dr. Rich covered this. What was suggested in the 2016 guideline as a starting point, again, it depends on the individual patient, but perhaps 10% per month or even a slower rate uh, as a starting point. And again, individualizing plans for tapering based on patient goals, their concerns, their context for pain management. That, that's something very key to highlight here. And again, in the, in the same vein as individualizing a plan, allowing for pauses in the taper depending on where the patient is in their tapering process. Next slide, please. Um, accessing appropriate expertise if considering tapering opioids during pregnancy. Uh, discussing with patients the increased risk for overdose on an abrupt return to a previously prescribed higher dose. Just making sure that that risk is highlighted for patients. Um, again, remaining alert to signs of anxiety, depression, opioid use disorder that might be unmasked by an opioid taper, as Dr. Rich covered. And then again, optimizing psychosocial support for uh, anxiety that may be related to the tapering process. Next slide, please. In the time since the guidelines released in 2016, CDC has worked in uh, the areas depicted on this slide to disseminate and translate the guidance that was in, in the guideline. It's not enough to simply publish the guideline and put it out there in the public. We worked very actively to make sure that the content and the recommendations with the guideline were well understood by its intended audiences. So just to highlight a few efforts in that area. Uh, first, for translation and communication, we developed a whole suite of translational products that are available at CDC's website that help to um, translate the content within the guidelines. So things like fact sheets, um, we have a mobile app that brings a guideline to your smartphone, just as a few examples. Clinical training, um, we have a, a suite of interactive uh, clinician training modules that's posted at the CDC website that walks through the guidance in the CDC guideline, um, offers some self-check um, questions, um, offers CME, there also immediately following the release of the guideline was a series of, of, of webinars to uh, clinical audiences that also walk through the guidance in the guideline. Uh, number three, health system implementation. We've worked very closely with a number of health systems to uh, better integrate the guidance in the CDC guideline into clinical workflow. So this would include efforts as such as clinical decision support, uh, working to better integrate this into EHRs. And then lastly, working closely with insurers and pharmacy benefit managers to uh, better implement the guidance uh, and the guideline, especially with our non-pharmacologic ways of uh, treating pain. Next slide, please. Wanted to touch a little bit on this as well. So efforts to improve opioid prescribing and reducing misuse of opioids and, uh, and, and overdoses have been commendable, but there have been some policies and practices that have cited the guideline that did uh, go beyond its recommendations and were inconsistent with its guidance. Um, for example, the guideline doesn't support abrupt tapering. Uh, it doesn't support sudden discontinuation of opioids. Unfortunately, it's been inappropriately cited to justify hard limits or cutting off of opioids. And we have heard reports of misapplication beyond the guidelines very clearly stated scope. So for instance, some examples there would be applying the recommendations to patients and cancer treatment, which was not the intended scope, or those patients experiencing post-surgical pain. Remember the intended audience for the guideline was primary care. And then also misapplying the guidelines dosage recommendations to medications for opioid use disorder. That was also not the intent. Uh, we continue to work to address misapplication of the guideline beyond its intended scope. So what's listed here on the slide represents a letter that CDC had sent in February of 2019 to the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the American Society of Hematology, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Network that reiterated, as stated in the guideline, that the guideline is providing recommendations specifically for treating chronic pain outside of the realm of active cancer treatment, palliative care, and midlife care. Also, that guidelines for pain control specifically in sickle cell disease should be used to guide decisions for that patient population, not the CDC guideline. That was not its intended scope. 
And then again, I can't emphasize this enough, clinical decision making should be based on an understanding of that individual patient's clinical situation, their functioning, their life context, and their goals for pain management. And really to carefully consider the benefits and risks of all treatment options, including opioids. Next slide, please. In a New England Journal of Medicine commentary um, and an accompanying CDC media advisory that was also released in April of last year, uh, the guideline authors outlined some examples of misapplication of the guideline. And they highlighted advice from the guideline that's sometimes overlooked, but is critical for safe and effective implementation of the recommendations. So just to, to cite a quote that was in this commentary, quote, Effective implementation of the guideline requires recognition that there are no shortcuts to safer opioid prescribing, which includes assessments of benefits and risks, patient education and risk mitigation, or to appropriate and safe reduction or discontinuation of opioid use. Starting fewer patients in opioid treatment and not escalating the high dosages in the first place will reduce the numbers of patients prescribed high dosages in the long term. In the meantime, consistent with the 2016 guideline, Clinicians can maximize use of non-opioid treatments, review with patients the benefits and risks of continuing opioid treatment, provide interested and motivated patients with support to slowly taper opioid dosages, closely monitor and mitigate overdose risk for patients who continue to take opioid, high dose opioids, and offer a range medication assisted treatment when opioid use disorder is identified. Next slide, please. Just a word about the guideline update process. So in the 2016 guideline, uh, we had noted that CDC would revisit the guideline to determine when the evidence gaps had been sufficiently closed to warrant updating its recommendations. Uh, next slide, please. And since release of the 2016 guideline, um, there have been calls for CDC to provide a guideline of prescribing opioids for acute pain. So beyond its initial scope of chronic pain, um, these requests have come from professional specialty societies, from senators, and from the media. Next slide, please. In order to identify whether evidence gaps have been sufficiently addressed to warn updates to or an expansion in the scope of the guideline, CDC funded the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality to conduct five systematic reviews on the effectiveness of opioids, non-opioid pharmacologic medications, and non-pharmacologic treatments for both acute and chronic pain. The three draft reviews on non-pharmacologic, non-opioid pharmacologic, and opioid treatments for chronic pain were posted for public comment last October, and the final versions were very recently released. And based on that, CDC has determined that a guideline update is warranted. Uh, the two reviews on treatments for acute pain are anticipated to be released later this year, and that could help inform decisions on whether CDC will further expand the guideline into the treatment of acute pain. Next slide, please. So what the evidence in these new systematic reviews may allow for, it could provide potentially for additional detail on non-pharmacologic and non-opioid pharmacologic therapies for chronic pain, it could update information on benefits and risks of non-pharmacologic, non-opioid pharmacologic and opioid therapies for chronic pain. It could expand guidance on acute pain and it could potentially expand guidance on opioid tapering. Next slide, please. So just to outline a few steps that will facilitate uh, the update of the CDC guideline for prescribing opioids, as mentioned, uh, it's the review of the five systematic evidence reviews. Um, <clears throat> CDC has also requested the establishment of a Board of Scientific Counselors expert work group to provide input to the CDC Injury Center's Board of Scientific Counselors. And the guideline update development process will include a public comment period through the Federal Register uh, once an update or an expansion is drafted. Next slide, please. And I will close my presentation there. I look forward to questions and we'll turn it back over to Helen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Really helpful. And as I was looking at the chat, several questions came up about your plans to update that we'll return to in the, in the Q&A as well. So next, I'd like to turn to uh, Daniel Necht, who will uh, give us overview of the work they've been doing at Aetna. Daniel? Great. Uh, Helen, can you hear me? Yes, please. Go ahead. 
Great, excellent. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all on this really important topic. Uh, I'm coming to you with a little bit of a different perspective. I still practice medicine as a hospitalist, but uh, my day job is working at CVS Aetna uh, in health strategy. So thinking about the unmet health needs of our members and communities we serve in developing and executing strategies to, to impact those. So um, if you look at the next slide, I'm sure you're very well aware the uh, unprecedented circumstances our society finds itself in as it relates to, to opioid-related deaths. Um, unfortunately, this graphic is uh, overly simplistic, right? Um, what it does not take into account is the large number of individuals struggling with uh, undertreated or mistreated pain that sort of the, was the preceding uh, epidemic to this uh, opioid crisis we find ourselves in. I think the other sort of nuance here is that there is a substantial shift between opioid-related deaths from prescription painkillers, prescription opioids, to illicit uh, uh, opioids such as heroin and increasingly fentanyl, but also polysubstance um, use, um, increasingly cocaine uh, with the synthetic uh, fentanyl. So this is a uh, an ever-changing um, crisis we find ourselves in. And then, you know, only a few months ago, we saw some glimmers of hope as it relates to reduction in individuals dying from drug-related overdoses. Uh, I'm very uh, nervous to see what the implications of COVID-19 will be on individuals struggling with chronic pain or substance use disorder, more broadly speaking. So um, it's with that on the next slide, leadership at Aetna and CVS uh, asked the clinical um, leaders across the company to think about a, str a strategic and holistic view to to impacting this, this spate of opioid uh, misuse and addiction. So um, we came up with this very simple strategic framework here. Um, it's, a, it's an arrow, but if I had my druthers, I'd actually change the slide to make it look like a circus balloon. And it, it, so when you think about a balloon, if you clamp down on only one part of the balloon, it reforms, it re-emerges, and you really haven't made much of an impact. So our thinking here is we need to be as holistic and and comprehensive and impacting the opioid uh, crisis as possible. So um, on the far left hand of the slide, it's prevention. So if it's pre preventing misuse and abuse of opioids before it occurs. So um, as any health insurer, we have clinical policies in place around accessing uh, non-opioid pain treatment modalities. So our policies, uh, uh, provide coverage for uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, chiropractic care, um, a variety of non-opioid um, uh, medications, including NSAIDs and TCAs. Um, as it relates to our pharmacy benefit, we put in place a seven-day limit on uh, opioids prescribed for acute purposes, such as post-surgical um, and acute pain. We do have prior authorizations in place for the use of uh, opioids for chronic indications. And that really is an opportunity for our clinicians to have a peer-to-peer -peer conversation with the prescriber, just ensure there's proper uh, thought and consideration about prescribing opioids. Uh, at the end of the day, we respect that therapeutic alliance between the patient and the physician, but at the same time, you know, there re really needs to be some, some guardrails around these, these products. So, um, that is the prevent prevention pillar. I will call out a, a, a very innovative program that uh, my colleagues at CBS Retail have, have launched. So it's essentially called an OTC opioid switch program. So uh, when a customer comes to our pharmacist for a prescription for an opioid for a simple dental procedure, our pharmacist will have a conversation with that individual around if they would be interested in trying an OTC Advil, or ibuprofen, and acetaminophen in lieu of filling that first opioid prescription. So we've had really um, uh, encouraging data there. Uh, ultimately, if the patient wants to fill the prescription of opioid, we won't get. We certainly will uh, abide by that. But again, we feel like that additional um, offer of education and counseling is, is valuable, and, and we've seen that uh, bear fruit. Um, the next pillar is intervention. So as many of you are aware, uh, at CVS Aetna, a very large healthcare company sitting on uh, a large repository of data uh, and, and insights. So this is where we use our data analytics 
in a way that we think brings a lot of value to the to our customers. So we have a number of programs in place uh, that prevent doctor shopping, shopping uh, by looking at being filled in multiple locations. Um, we have another program that we ran for a few years where we sent uh, letters to prescribers of opioids that sort of fell in the sort of, we call them super prescribers, but really those are doctors that are in the, the far statistical significance uh, direction in the wrong way. So the top 1% of prescribers, top 5% of prescribers and let them know that their prescribing habits were not uh, in norms with their peer group. Um, I do get the question, however, is well, do you refer these uh, prescribers to the, the authorities? And we, the answer is we work closely with our special investigations unit to uh, work with law, and, law enforcement when there's clear uh, potential illegal activity going on. But the purpose of that program really is to say, you know, physicians want to do well, they just sometimes are stuck in clinical inertia, haven't kept up with the CDC guidelines, for example, and would benefit from that nudge. Also in the intervention uh, bucket, we feel that Narcan um, is an underutilized uh, resource. So we were the first payer to uh, remove the copay on Narcan for some of our members. Um, and the idea there was we wouldn't want an individual who had a prescription for an opioid plus naloxone or Narcan to go to the pharmacy and walk away if there was a copay or financial barrier in place. So um, we've also donated Narcan across the country uh, in conjunction with um, you know, local community partners. And then finally, the support pillar. And as that epidemic continues to shift from opioid, uh, prescription opioids to the illicit opioids, um, this is increasingly important. So how do we identify and support our members that are struggling with opioid use disorder or substance use disorder and get evidence-based treatment? And so we were one of the first payers to um, remove the prior authorization on uh, buprenorphine and other uh, medication-assisted therapies. Um, we have a program called the Guardian Angel program, which I'll talk about in, in uh, upcoming minutes. Um, so this just sort of gives an outline of our overall strategy. And as the epidemic continues uh, to shift, you know, we, we will continue to sort of move our resources around to make the biggest impact for our membership. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, Guardian Angel program is a really unique and impactful program. Um, so essentially, th this, this program was uh, launched based on a really important clinical insight we had. We noticed uh, every month our members uh, were uh, you know, suffering opioid overdoses in the hundreds each each and every month. So we we launched this program where we essentially have a skilled clinician solely uh, focused on making telephonic uh, calls to our members who have had an overdose. So we have claims data that trigger that triggers the program to say we had somebody who ended up in the emergency room had an overdose and we, we need to have an assertive outreach to help these people. So we've launched this program over the course of um, a year and a half, and we've had some really good outcomes. But essentially what happens is our case manager calls this, this member and engages in motivational interviewing, trying to understand what happened, how we can help. And I think most importantly, connecting these individuals with local uh, resources, namely, uh, physicians who prescribe medication-assisted therapy and provide evidence-based care for opioid addiction. And so if you look at the next slide, uh, we've had really uh, encouraging data. We've had, uh, we've engaged over 50% of our members we've done outbound uh, calls to. We've helped over a, a thousand uh, individuals who are victims of an opioid overdose. And on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, I, I, really, the take home here is you look at, at this, just the sheer diversity of individuals across our country struggling with opioid use disorder. We've helped individuals as young as 70, uh, 17 and as old as, um, yeah, we have 60 here, but even older than that. And, you know, their routes to opioid addiction are quite varied. Some, you know, we hear firsthand 
um, heroin is being used as a party drug in high school or an individual who, ha who received opioids after an athletic injury or after struggling with chronic pain for a while, but, but ultimately they end up um, with an overdose. And so the, the whole purpose of this program is to break that cycle of addiction and connect them to local resources. And then the last program on the upcoming slide is uh, an academic detailing program. So, um, you know, as, as, as you all know, the genesis of this, of this uh, opioid crisis really is due to inappropriate and over inappropriate marketing of, of opioids. So we took a page out of that playbook and uh, partnered with a nonprofit organization based in Boston called the Losa Health. And what we're doing is deploying a, a field force of 30 specially trained academic detailers. These are clinicians, whether they be pharmacists, doctors, or nurses, to visit uh, Aetna participating providers, literally knock on their door and sit down and provide them a face-to-face -face education around how to appropriately prescribe opioids for acute and chronic pain, but also how to screen and treat and support people with opioid use disorder. So. Uh, we launched this more than a year ago. We've uh, engaged over probably 10,000 providers or physicians to date, um, and we're getting really uh, great feedback from the, the provider community. I think the, the resounding uh, insight is that these doctors don't um, have sufficient training or their training is out of date, and so providing updated uh, insights around uh, the guy, CDC guidelines and other guidelines it really is embraced. So um, we continue to innovate on this program. We're now rolling out a value-based contract with these providers to incentivize them to further engage with our providers, but also pay them for um, you know, value-based payments if they are prescribing opioids prudently and avoiding concomitant opioids and benzo pain uh, prescribing, which is a huge driver of opioid overdoses. So. More to come on that, but it's a really exciting program. And actually, Dr. Mikus is on our advisory board that helps curate the um, guidelines we're proliferating to these uh, providers. So with that, I'll turn it back to Helen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. There was already some great questions in the chat box about how do we make that a standard for other payers, which is a, a high praise, I think, and perhaps we'll come back to that. So last and certainly not least, I'm delighted to turn the uh, podium over to the virtual podium, <laughs> over to uh, Penny Cowan, who's the fender, founder and CEO of the American Chronic Pain Association, has been really integral to our efforts, particularly to our patient listening sessions. So with that, Penny, I turn it over to you. The self management. Next slide, please. Um, and, and quite often, what we do is we look to our healthcare professionals to take care of us. And the problem is, they, they quite often they don't tell us that there may always be some level of pain. Our expectation may be for them to treat us and just get rid of it. Next slide, please. Uh, what we don't, what they don't realize is the amount of fear that a person has when it comes to chronic pain. Um, the fear of further injury, if something happens, you know, they're assuming that that's pain, or if they have an event to go to, quite often what will happen so that they don't have more pain while they're on an event, they'll take more medication. And that's how they run out of these medications and tend to get in trouble. Next slide, please. Um, but they really do need reassurance of that their pain. As we heard this morning from um, Megan Kennedy, about the stigma that people with um, opioid use disorder have that, you know, everybody with pain is looked at the same lens, even when they're taking medications for chronic pain. Um, and so they need that validation. They need to be believed they're very defensive. So if providers only believe their pain, it would take away a lot of the defenses that they're getting the feedback from for people. Next slide, please. So we look to our healthcare providers to help us, to begin to help us manage the pain. The problem is that they really, many of them have limited experience. They're not sure you know, how to help us as, as we begin that journey from passive patient back to an active participant in our healthcare. So quite often what we hear is learn to live with it. Next slide, please. 
And so this is what it looks like when they tell us to learn to live with it. And I have no clue what this is. I could not solve it if you asked me to. You know, however, if I took a few classes and I started with algebra, worked my way through up to, you know, plane geometry, trig, even differential equations, and I had a really good teacher and I worked really hard, I could solve the problem. The problem is we need to be taught. We don't know how to live with pain. Somebody has to teach me. Don't tell me, please teach me. Next slide, please. Teach me how to live with it. Um, and, and that's really key is don't tell me, teach me. Next slide. So we have to learn to live with it. And part of the problem is when you talk to a person with pain, all they talk about is what pain's taken away from them. They never, we never, no one ever asks you, what can you still do? And I think that is one of the keys is what are your abilities? What is it that you can still do? Next slide, please. Um, and so, as I said before, we really have to begin moving from that passive patient to an active participant in our health care. Next slide. Realizing the goal of pain management is to improve quality of life, increase function, and reduce your sense of suffering. And again, nowhere in this goal does it say get rid of your pain completely. That's not something that's going to happen for most people living with pain. Next slide, please. So to do that, though, one of the big problems is, again, you know, we go back to that passive patient. The person must become an active participant in their health care. They need to know what's their role in managing their pain as they move from patient back to person. Next slide, please. And as we heard earlier today from um, Daniel Ford, and excuse me if I, if I um, pronounce your name wrong, about the communication gap between providers and, and people with pain. So what we need now is to, a way to better communicate, to bridge that gap. We need, and so there's three, you can click three times to show that it's, we need things that are more easy to understand, more informative, and more efficient so that we can begin to communicate in that short amount of time that we have with our provider, what our needs are and what's going on with us and how to explain what's happening. Next slide, please. So the first thing is, you know, on that scale of zero to 10, which most of people with pain, you know, really don't like, um, we decided that we needed to have a quality of life scale, which is gonna measure function. We flipped the scale, meaning zero, you, even, you can't even get out of bed. That's zero amount of functioning, all the way up to 10, where you function as a normal person without pain. And so every one of these numbers has it a function, which is really the key to moving from patient to person and regaining some control of your life. Next slide, please. But there's also a lot of other things that contribute to our pain that are never asked or never thought about in that, again, that short amount of time that we have with our provider. So we've developed this intake form where you can ask them their pain score, and we still use the zero to 10 because that's what they have to chart. But then we're going to ask them a number of other things, their stress, their exercise, their sleep, um, you know, the, the fear of the pain, taking their medications prescribed, the side effects, their constipation, their sexual activity, their appetite, their mood, how isolated they become, how alcohol they drink, um, how worried about finances when we need to add smoking to this. So they can see where they're at. But this is a one-time thing. Next slide, please. But when you go into your provider, they're going to ask you how you are, and you're going to tell them, this is how I feel today. We don't remember a week ago, a month ago, or, or what happened between our visits. So that tool that I just showed you is now interactive on our webpage, and you can actually track this, each one of those measures, and begin to print out. Next slide, please. You can actually now begin to see when you go or that your provider can pull it up for you, a graph of this is exactly what's happened, and you can begin to now connect the dots that maybe the pain score went up because you weren't sleeping, maybe you had side effects, you either took too much medication or didn't take enough, um, you were constipated, I mean, a number of different things, you're isolated, so maybe that's more a key toward the depression rather than even what's going on with the pain. So it gives you clues on, on what area you might need to focus on for these folks. Uh, next slide, please. And the other thing we always have problems with is how do we describe our pain? because we want to be believed, we want that validation, as I said earlier. So the American Chronic Pain Association has developed a number of um, pain maps. And these, everything I've showed you is free on our webpage. You don't have to, it's just available access to anybody. And this one in particular is for low back pain, and it asks where your pain radiates from, 
and, and you just put your cursor right on, on the place where it is, your hip, your buttocks or whatever, and it'll ask, you know, what are the symptoms? How does it feel? Numbness, burning, and they're animated little things, and they go on the top score, and then the, the intensity of your pain, and then uh, how does the pain begin, and there's a number of questions, and what makes the pain worse? Next slide, please. So that you can actually then print out a map of your pain. A picture's worth a thousand words. So instead of trying to explain all this, you have maps. We have them for headache pain, for fibromyalgia, diabetic peripheral neuropathy, and also for um, nerve pain. Next slide, please. Another thing is that people get confused about how to take their medication, and they're the ones that are responsible for that. Keep in mind that, you know, there's only so much a provider can do, and then it's up to that person to sort of follow through. And so we actually worked um, when we declared September Pain Awareness Month and had a number of partners. We did a toolkit for pharmacists one year, and we worked with the American Pharmacists Association and developed this tool to help people better understand how to take their medication because they don't remember. They would call our office and ask us. So do they take it morning or night or what time of the day? Do they take it with food, without? All you have to do is circle these. Um, you know, what are the side effects and what are the things that you have to be aware of, you know, the, the, the restrictions when you're taking these kind of medicines. And then most importantly, especially with opioids, is how to store them and dispose of them properly. Next slide, please. But so what are then the other responsibilities of a person living with pain if they're really going to move from patient back to person? Next slide. So we have this, this what we call our 10 steps from patient to person. And they're not like a 12-step program where you have to do each step uh, in any order, except for, the I believe, the first two. And the first one's accepting the pain, knowing that at some point in time, you have to realize that pain may be a part of your life. That doesn't mean it has to control you or take over you, but it may be a part of your life. And then you actually have to get involved. You can't just sit there and expect someone to make you better. It's not going to work. We also need to know what our priorities are. We need to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning. That's why learning what our, what our priorities are, what our abilities are, so that we begin to look at our priorities and, and set some priorities for ourselves. And then to have realistic goals. The problem is pain is never consistent. We have good days and bad days. And on the good days, we try to do so much. We don't pace ourselves. We don't listen to our body. That's where they get in trouble. That's where they often will take more medication than they should. Um, and they get into trouble because they run out before they should. So we really have to set realistic goals and narrow them down to small manageable steps and listen to our body. And when we feel that first out, stop, just rest for a little bit. And then knowing their basic rights is actually really important because pain takes so much of our self-esteem away from us. Many of us, because we've gone through so much and are told it's all in our head and all these other things that we need to feel like we have the right to to be treated with dignity and respect, the right to say no, the right to make mistakes, the right to do less than humanly possible, the right to ask for help, all those things. And emotions do play a part. So you really have to begin to recognize emotions and understand that there are no wrong feelings or inappropriate actions and recognize your emotions and begin to deal with each one as it comes. And then obviously, you know, stress is going to play a huge part in your, in your pain and increasing your pain. So how do you learn to relax? How do you tell your body to begin? First, you have to listen to it and then relax. And this is, you know, this is something that takes a little bit of effort, takes training. We actually have uh, some audios on our webpage and a beautiful video on how to relax, a five-minute video on relaxation. And it just leads you through your whole body to relax. Again, that's free. Um, and exercise is so very important. And this is something that you really do have to do. With, on your own, even with COVID now, I mean, a lot of people, and I've seen, I can't tell you how many websites and how many emails I've gotten that you can actually now, they show you how to do exercises at home, just getting out and walking, you know, keep moving, that's really important. And then again, looking at your abilities, not don't focus on your disabilities. I really believe that 80 or 90% of how well someone does really depends on their attitude. And then to really reach out to other people and let them know that they're not alone because pain is so very isolating. And the more we isolate, the more pain tends to take control of our thoughts, our deeds, and it just con totally consumes us. Uh, next slide, please. So to sort of sum all this up, we always, we always talk about a person with pain like a car with four flat tires. 
and everyone's expectation is all I need is one pill and I'm good to go, the problem is it only puts air in one of their tires. And it may give them the 30 or 40% it's designed to do, but they still have three flat tires and they can't go anywhere. So the question is, what else do they need? And for every person, it's going to be different. It could be physical therapy. It could be counseling. It could be nutritional guidance, maybe a peer-led support group. When they get all four tires filled, it's their job to maintain their car. You don't take your car back to the dealer and say, wash my windshield or fill her up. That's your job. If something goes wrong with the top car, then we take it in for a checkup. You see, it's a combination of treatments and therapies, but the person with pain at the center is going to get you up and get you going again. Next slide. So thank you very much um, for your attention. And <clears throat> excuse me, next slide. That is our webpage. Again, all the tools I've showed you are free on our website, or you can call our office to get directions. Thank you very much. Thank I'll you. turn it back over to Alan. Got it. Thank you so much, Penny. Appreciate it. We are um, at time, it turns out, but I have been given special dispensation if our uh, speakers can stay with us. We'll try to go till um, uh, till two o'clock Eastern time to try to capture some of the questions. Uh, there have been a remarkable amount of questions in the chat box, I think many of which uh, you have addressed as we've gone through it. But why don't we try to highlight a few key areas to start with. This issue of unintended consequences of guidelines came up repeatedly in the chat as well as our prior discussions, including specifically to Christina's point about misinterpretation and misapplication of the guideline. How do we prospectively think about measuring the both positive and negative impact of guidelines? And I really liked what Roger said. We, we can't just look at how much um, opioids are prescribed um, in terms of the outcome of a guideline. What, how do we better interpret some of these uh, 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 outcomes that were mentioned like function and quality of life um, into the assessment going forward? Uh, anybody's welcome to start. Um, yeah, this is this is Roger. I, I mean, I, I think that um, it, it has been a, a challenge to evaluate um, policies and guidelines because, um, you know, by nature, you know, these are implemented in the real world. They're not randomized trials, et cetera. Um, and a lot of the research has focused on looking at data from administrative databases which are just not set up to look at those types of patient-centered outcomes. Um, I, I think that we need to develop, you know, prospective pain registries where um, perhaps using some of the tools that Penny or, or similar to some of the tools that Penny describes where patients can be reporting their outcomes and we can actually understand what's happening, uh, not just with the guidelines and related policies, but with different types of treatments and approaches and things like that. I, I think that would be a pretty powerful um, uh, tool to look at it. But, but I think the, the bottom line is that our, our, our tools right now are often um, administrative databases, which is mostly you know, billing and coding data. Um, and they're just not set up um, to look at uh, the types of patient outcomes that are really important. Couldn't agree more. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah, Helen. Yeah, I would also add, I second what Roger just said, and I would extend that even further to say, again, look at the practical, the practice-based application of the, what happens, again, and, and measure the effect actually in the real-world practice, not so much in the academic center, but in the primary care practice, the street-level practice, again, that has these patients day in and day out in the practice. Great. This is Christina. I just wanted to chime in and I, I echo everything that Roger highlighted about limitations of, of common data sets that are often used in this kind of evaluation. Um, I can speak to what CDC is, is doing. A lot of our work looking at opioid prescribing trends does indeed use administrative claims data to examine what trends look like in opioid prescribing. And no doubt, as Roger, as Roger highlighted, it really does lose that downstream um, impact on patients and it's not well captured there. However, it does have some utility in looking at least in the intended audience, for example, the CDC guideline and taking a look at provider populations and who may have had some impacts in opioid prescribing practices that could have been potentially a downstream effect of the CDC guideline, which of course was just targeted towards primary care providers. But yes, certainly I do appreciate comments around limitations of data, but um, always thinking ahead to how we can better evaluate this is, is definitely a good utility. 
Yeah. Daniel, any thoughts from the perspective of a payer that often is pretty reliant on um, claims data? Certainly not the initiative you mentioned, but maybe your perspective on how we can get from where we are now to where we need to be would be valuable. Uh, yeah, uh, so I, I'd say, um, you know, we as, a, as an industry are, do have the limitations of just claims data, demographic data. I think uh, in the era of increasing data interoperability, being able to tap into EMR, EMR data is really important. I think also we just need to be more, you know, patient-centric and, and really get their insights uh, much more than, uh, than we are now. So I think that's something, you know, as an industry, we, we really need to put more effort into. Yeah, I think that leads in nicely to what Penny pointed out around uh, don't don't tell me, teach me, and the importance of shared decision making as really a cornerstone for a lot of these discussions. Um, any comments around how we might really be able to build more shared decision making, including around tapering and other topics into what is often a very crowded um, clinical visit as one of the participants pointed out on the chat? Yeah, I can begin by, by answering and, you know, using some of the tools that we had, letting the person with pain, <clears throat> excuse me, know that they have to prepare for their visit ahead of time so that they're ready to really have a meaningful discussion and then that they have that right to ask questions and not to leave the office unless they understand what they're being told or the teach back moments for the provider to actually ask the questions. Do you understand what I just said? Because too often people just sit there and shake their head and they really don't even know, they're just doing it. So I think there needs to be more understanding between that we're having a, co a meaningful conversation, but that person with pain has every right to, to ask questions and be part of that conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, Chuck again. Uh, Helen, I would I second what Penny just said, and I would say that again, it can start from the minute the patient checks in in the lobby of a practice, you can actually start administering tools there that a patient can be filling out while waiting to be seen in terms of documenting their experiences and what their expectations are. Plus, again, you know, one of the things I teach providers is to take a second, slow down, and try to listen to the patient for at least a few seconds and everything. It's amazing, again, what, what a few seconds of just listening to the patient can make to that patient, patient encounter. Agree. Roger? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, I, I mean, I, I think it's important for, I, I, I think actually clinicians actually aren't always clear what shared decision making means. They, they think it's just leaving it to the patient or just going along with what, what the patient is saying. And it really does need to be a shared process. Um, and there are some decisions that are, are, are more, you know, the, the, the applicability of shared decision making really depends on the decision. So if if a, a patient is unsafe, if they've had an overdose, for example, and it's unsafe to continue them on opioids, you know, that's a decision the clinician has to make. But decisions can be made on a shared decision making basis about how the tapering would go, how frequently or how quickly it would go, what kinds of tools can be used to help the patient through that. And I think the clinician has to be clear about what kinds of decisions you know, um, are, are really amenable to the shared decision-making process. Uh, and like I said, there are times when the risks just outweigh the benefits, and, and, it, and it is the responsibility, I would say, of the clinician um, to take action. Uh, but, but there's always a role for shared decision-making, I guess is my point. It just has to be clear, like, exactly what um, uh, is being addressed in that process. Yeah. Daniel, were, were, were you going to weigh in? No, I, I think that's right. I think from a payer perspective, you know, we are, when we make our clinical policies, we rely on the you know, body of evidence available and in the space of chronic pain, it's unfortunately there's not as much as we'd like to see. So it is threading a needle, but ultimately you know, our viewpoint, as I said earlier, is, you know, trying to hold that relationship between patient and, and, and uh, physician as sanctimonious as possibly as we can. Yeah. That's a great point. Another person in the chat box specifically talked about what strategies patients can use when they face barriers for non-opioid related therapies that many of you emphasize the importance of. 
um, including behavioral health services, a complementary pain therapy. So uh, some of you know, we, as part of our, the NAM initiative, we're working on a patient journey map to really see where there is evidence where we can help patients as they explore that journey. Maybe in our last two minutes, just a quick lightning round um, for the speakers who could stay with us briefly. Just if, if you had a, an opportunity to do something right now to really address the issues of uh, pain management for patients, particularly in light of what's been happening with COVID-19, a bit, bit of a resurgence in telemedicine, what might you recommend that we focus on next? And um, anybody can start, please. Um, I'll start first. And, and I think that, you know, encouraging people, staying in touch with people. Again, I talked about that isolation. And I think that's only more intensified with the COVID. So I know like for our support groups, they're doing a lot of them where they're doing, they're actually doing Zoom meetings or at least reaching out and calling each other. And I think for providers to have that telemedicine so that they don't miss their appointments. There's a lot of people that are afraid to go out looking, thinking, you know, I have all these coexisting uh, conditions that I, I'm gonna be more at risk. So I think telemedicine is, is an excellent way, but I, again, you know, just to reach out and make sure that they don't miss those appointments, they depend on them. And I know I heard about, you know, they can't do the urine drug strings and all of that right now. So, you know, I'm not sure how providers are dealing with all of that with COVID when people can't go in. But, you know, just staying in touch with people and keeping them active is, is really important so that they can maintain wellness. Great. Appreciate it. Um, Roger, any thoughts on that? No, I, I would agree with, with Penny. And, and I think, you know, the um, in the past, I, I think um, telemedicine has been underutilized um, in the arena of chronic pain as well as treatment of um, use disorders. And, and I think this is an opportunity, I guess, to really um, buff that up. I mean, this has actually been a longstanding problem. People who live in rural areas and being forced to come, you know, drive two or three hours to see their primary care doctor every month or every three months. Um, you know, is that really, really, has that really been a reasonable strategy or, you know, you know, should we have been doing a lot of this all along? Um, so, so I think this does give us an opportunity to rethink some of our practices. Um, I, 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 you know, the, some of the, the, the Zoom or, or the, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, online stuff is actually, you know, probably just about as good as doing things face-to-face. -face. And so I think we need to shift our thinking. Uh, we need to, again, understand the patient perspective about the kinds of burdens and, and, uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, that are being placed on them um, and to try to work around these things and to, um, uh, you know, uh, again, just facilitate care in a, in a patient-centered way. Absolutely. Thanks, Roger. Uh, Daniel? Yeah, I think the only thing I'll add, great comments by, the, by my peer panelists, is just let's not forget about the, the social determinants of health at this time you know, good nutrition, uh, addressing uh, isolation, uh, those sort of, we don't, you know, that, that, those, that domain has been, you know, has had short shrift for a long time. You know, I know it's even harder now with COVID, but that's when we really have to be innovative in, in addressing those topics. Yeah, and I'll add, add in, certainly having seen the disparities that have become very apparent during COVID-19, uh, just shining a light what's already been there about thinking even more broadly about um, other, uh, factors that are going to limit patients' access. Uh, Chuck or uh, yep. Christina, any last words? Chuck? Yeah, yeah, just a willingness. I mean, everybody said it well, but I think on the part of the provider, just a willingness to pivot and go with, and go with what we have. There's, these are challenging times. And certainly, again, it's nice to be able to see the patient every month in the clinic and do the drug screen every month in the visit, but we can't do that. So we have to adapt and within reason, again, adapt and make use of those additional things such as telemedicine. All right. The last 30 seconds for Christina, since we're already over time. Anything else you'd like to add? Sure. Uh, this is Christina. I think great points have been raised by others on the panel. Um, don't have much to add to that. You know, I, I do think it'll be interesting to see how telemedicine practices may be tweaked since COVID has really forced us to have a quick pivot. Um, it really has exposed vulnerabilities if for patients, for pain management. And, you know, there, there have been some adaptations of policies by federal agencies to help facilitate um, you know, enhanced telemedicine. So I think we stand to learn a lot that COVID has really forced upon us. Great.
Thank you so much. And thank you to this wonderful panel for uh, uh, really shining the light on some incredibly important issues as we move forward around pain management. With that, I'll turn it back to the NAM staff to let you know how long your break really is now that I've extended it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Helen. Thanks. Thanks to you all for your terrific presentations and discussion. We are going to take a now very short break, but that's okay because we're all still in the comfort of our own homes. Um, and we'll resume at 2.10 p.m. Eastern time, so in about six minutes. Thanks.